introduce you to um, four speakers uh, who, um, as I um, introduce your names, please come up. Chris Ilias is the president of the Global Development Programme. Bruce McNamara is the CEO of TechnoServe. Serpil Timore, and I hope I've pronounced your name uh, correctly, there is the CEO of Vodafone in Turkey. And Duncan Learmouth is the senior vice president of Galaxo uh, Smith Klein. And today, the purpose of this session is to showcase some of the innovative um, mobile solutions offered by not just Vodafone, but there is an example of that here, but by others as well in um, health and agriculture. And I think the sense that we have today is that there has been a wealth of pilot of project within the health education public sector and developed uh, in developed markets. Um, things are working and in finance. Um, but there are, it seems, exceptions that prove the rule that not enough is being done to get pilot and aid and, and, and projects through to sort of scalability, getting things to, to, to, uh, to market and making them work. I know that these case studies that we have today are good examples of those that have worked. So, uh, Chris, um, who should we start with? Yeah, Chris, let's start with you. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about what, at, how we think about this at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So uh, the foundation is dedicated to the idea that everyone deserves a chance at a healthy and productive life. And we deploy a fair amount of philanthropic capital every year to try and realize that vision, focusing on the poorest of the poor, typically those with incomes of $2 or less or, uh, a day or less, uh, focusing on the smallholder farmers in places like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of those smallholder farmers are women. Um, and we, this is about, this is, we're now in the second decade of the Gates Foundation's um, existence. And not surprisingly, given some of the trends we heard about this morning, that our partners and grantees are increasingly seeing information and communication technology as a key tool in achieving these philanthropic goals. And there are lots of interesting examples, some of which have scaled. Um, so for instance, we have a, a project, a um, large project in northern India and Bihar, where one element of the program, our, our partner there is working with village doctors, many of whom have minimal training, in some cases no training, but that's who people go to when they're sick. Um, they have a very basic range of skills, and so now there's a system in place where they can using their mobile phone, call to a call center in the, in the capital city and get some expert advice to help them walk through how best to manage this patient. Similarly, we've um, used, or partners have used, text messaging for surveillance for outbreaks, for instance, of Japanese encephalitis. Um, so the, the aggregated pattern of text messages about cases of this rare or epidemic disease can be seen by the epidemiologist so that a, a proper response can be put in place. SMS has also been used to encourage people to adhere for their medicines, particularly for things like tuberculosis treatment, which is a six to nine month course of treatment and requires, in order to avoid antibiotic drug resistance, that the drugs be taken on schedule every day. So these are interesting, emerging, we're seeing more and more of these, we're seeing more and more of them scale. But to some extent, these are the obvious uses of mobile technology. We use the phone to make a call or to send an SMS. What I think is, and that's great, but I think that the next the part of the future is about how do we combine this important tool, which is getting greater and greater penetration, with other sources of data and with political engagement around how to use that data for benefit. So let me give you the one example I want to go into in some depth. I was uh, two weeks ago in Nigeria where the Gates Foundation, together with a broad range of partners, is involved in the final push to eradicate polio. We're very, very close to eradicating polio. It's only three countries that have never broken transmission, and we've only had about 200 cases so far this year. We're in a better position in terms of fewer polio cases in fewer places than we've ever seen. But one of the final battlegrounds is, is in northern Nigeria. 
And there, one of the problems has been the quality of the campaigns to get polio vaccine out to people. So one of the things that we're doing in, in conjunction with the, the government of Nigeria is taking important data for geospatial mapping. So one of the first steps was to get good quality um, geographic information system data about one meter square maps of the eight northern states of, in, of Nigeria so that we actually understood where the households were. And up to ten, in many areas, up to 10% of the human settlements weren't on the maps that were previously being used by the vaccinators. So we worked to get better maps and to give the vaccinators better charges for where they needed to go in their daily course of giving vaccines. But then we combined that with giving the vaccinator teams mobile devices that would plot their GPS positioning and send out a signal every two minutes about where they actually were. So at the end of the day of the campaign in what's called the evening meeting, this data from the mobile um, technologies would be uploaded onto those very detailed GIS maps and we could see which households were actually missed or in some cases which entire villages were missed by the vaccinator teams so that then those teams could be sent back the next day. The key thing is that the data, the mobile uh, data that gives us the important positioning about where people actually went is then combined with a political process because in these evening meetings it's not just the local public health staff but it's the local political leadership that attends. So that on a daily basis in these, in these campaigns, you're getting a feedback of the data into a decision-making and accountability perform uh, process that ensures the performance. And overall, we've seen the quality and the coverage of these campaigns go up dramatically just in the last 18 months, which is going to be a key element of the success of finally pol uh, eradicating polio. So my, I guess my key message is that not surprisingly, these tools, as they become more ubiquitous, are being used more commonly. But to, the real impact, I think, is going to be to go the next step, which has rarely been done, which is to take the data and the facilitation of communication that comes with mobile technology, combine it with other sources of big data, combine it with the kind of data that Vodafone and other mobile network operators have about usage patterns in areas, um, and to then uh, combine that with our emerging knowledge of behavioral economics and other things so that we can now target our interventions so that we have a bigger social impact. That's what I think is the most exciting opportunity and potential for the trends you've been hearing about this morning. Thank you. Fascinating. All right, good. Uh, Bruce, um, you're going to uh, just showcase for a short time some of the work being done by Technoserve, I know, including the... Uh, USAID, Vodafone and TechnoServe partnership, which increases the productivity, incomes and resiliences of small farm holders uh, in Kenya, Mozambique and Tanzania. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you. Um, and let me just start by telling you, TechnoServe is a, a, a non-profit, but one focused on private sector solutions to poverty in the world's poorest countries. And we've been doing this for about 45 years. And because it's still the case that most of the world's poorest people live on farms, uh, most of our work is focused on agribusiness in these countries. Um, and that is working, say, last year with about 600,000 smallholder farmers, helping them think about market opportunities for their crop production, aggregating that production, accessing markets and credit, working along value chains with the providers of inputs to help them get the credit and the market access they need, working with big agribusinesses who are the buyers of products from smallholder farmers and the like. So this is the world and the context in which we begin to think about the opportunities for mobile applications in agriculture or M-Agri. And I'll tell you, it's from that perspective that up until two or three years ago, I would have said that opportunity is massively overhyped. Uh, I think people were very, very thrilled by the idea that actually people could get phones in very remote places, but from our perspective and from a market mechanism uh, point of view, uh, sort of the hype didn't really live up to observed realities on the ground. I would say that has changed pretty dramatically, uh, even in the last two or three years, driven by any number of factors, a continued penetration of uh, mobile um, uh, into very remote areas. The success of business models, payments particularly, 
uh, in Kenya, for example, around M-Pesa, which has been discussed here, around evolving kind of value-added services that the mobile operators and others are developing that actually do help facilitate markets. And I think we've gotten to the point where we are maybe appropriately hyped vis-a-vis uh, -vis the potential for mobile in agriculture. And that, I think, uh, in the first instance, um, and critically, importantly, is around access to information. Um, and you think about the context here for farmers. Um, you know, farmers in remote places in Mozambique, their lives are not dissimilar to how their lives and their production has been for hundreds and hundreds of years, and not dissimilar from the farm in England that Mike described uh, in the last session. They are fundamentally cut off for, from relevant market information, and that by virtue of just their remoteness, poor roads, poor formal education, until recently, no telephone contact with the world. Um, and so very, and, and these are vital pieces of information and they pertain to farming itself. It's what does, is there a market for my crops? What particular crop should I plant? What's the weather look like for the next five days, 10 days, for the next season vis-a-vis -vis my planting, my cultivation, my harvesting of my product? Once I harvest my product, actually, how do I think about good agronomy? I mean, if, if Mike's thinking about giving birth to cows, well, are there ways that I can actually get access to that kind of information in a, in a mobile context? Um, and this is the kind of information the farmers need. Then once I harvest my product, then, all right, well, is there an actual specific buyer out there for the product? And do I have any information about pricing? This is the kind of information that's most relevant in a, in a farming context. It's the kind of information we've been trying to broker now for 45 years. And it's the kind of information now that mobile enables in ways it hasn't before. And so I think first and principally about access to information, I would cite just quickly a program that we've run with Tigo, actually, in, in Tanzania with support from USAID and uh, uh, the Gates Foundation and uh, GSMA, but that itself says, okay, it's TU Colomo is the program, and it says, what are the kind of principal pieces of information that we begin to broker between providers of that content and farmers? And three principally. One is around, very basically, weather. What's the weather look like for the next two days, five days, ten days, or seasonally? Secondly is around basic agronomy. It's what are some basic... I agri think of it as tips around agronomy for specific crops that can be mediated by mobile platforms. And we're starting there with five crops, but it will extend over time um, pretty extensively. Um, and then finally, in this instance, it's pricing information. Local pricing, I mean, people talk about price, whether it works or not, but pricing in a local and regional context and over time tying that into transaction platforms. So it's not just the pricing information, but can you actually buy and sell uh, over a mobile platform? Uh, and this targets 500,000 farmers in Tanzania, and it's kind of that first kind of building block in really leveraging what mobile and IT tech can offer for smallholder farmers. And then I think there are opportunities that are broader than that, and that does come to this, this the Vodafone partnership that we've now kicked off with Vodafone, part, a partnership with Vodafone, and again with USAID. Um, and uh, as was noted, that targets farmers in three countries, Mozambique and Tanzania and Kenya. But it seeks to do it in a broader, call it more systems-based approach. So it goes beyond the provision of information to really think to, for farmers to think about, but who are all the participants in agribusiness and how do we tie them together in a web that makes that market work in ways it just hasn't before. Um, and that, so for well, let me just actually, there are three pillars to this, and this, my describing those will help you to understand what I'm actually talking about here. The first is at the farm level itself, going beyond information to how do we use mobile, uniting kind of M Agri with M Finance. So we're aware, I think, collectively, the excessive payments platforms increasingly in a rural context, but in the program here, we're saying, all right, Bill, what's the access to a broader set of financial services, whether they're products that are tailored for smallholder farmers around savings or around credit, and the, the needs for rural borrowers are very different from those of, of urban borrowers, or around insurance, and most notably around, say, weather insurance as it relates to your crop. Now, what are the opportunities to bring down the transaction costs and to enrich the data we have about 
those kinds of products that will make underwriting them, will make the provision of those products uh, much more doable in a rural context. So that's one phase of this program. Uh, the second is more of a B2B platform. It says, all right, let's go beyond farmers and think about the broader set of, of, of commercial actors here, whether that's on the provision of inputs. So I may be an input supply company. I'm trying to think, actually, how do I use mobile to more efficiently get seed or fertilizer or credit out to remote places? It may be at the buyer side. I'm a big trading company. I'm a miller. I'm a retailer. How do I think about smart logistics, dis dispatching trucks, uh, actually with a better sort of uh, use of fuel and route uh, optimization using mobile technologies. Um, it may be around traceability. How can I actually track that crate of mangoes from the field to the truck to the warehouse, ultimately into the retail context because that's what my business requires. How do I manage not tens or hundreds of suppliers, how do I manage tens of thousands of suppliers and monitor their cultivation and their harvest and the aggregation of their product into my supply chain? So that's a B2B lens on this using mobile technologies that actually will knit this system together. And the third pillar of that is the knitters themselves. Who are the providers of these applications? And so what we're seeking to do in the program is set up incubators for entrepreneurs or software vendors or the providers of those value-added services. It might be content. Do I have a business idea for how I can get that agronomic information on onions out to a buyer of that information in a very remote context? I mean, is it... Do I have the kind of supply chain management application that is most uh, applicable in a Mozambican context? So incubation services, technical assistance to business providers, to entrepreneurs, getting them access to capital to help f fuel their innovation and to build their small companies. So there it is, again, pulling together a broader system and network of actors in really thinking about M agri in a serious way. And look, at the end of the day, people still got to go out and farm. And I was talking to Chris last night, he said, nobody's ever plowed a field with a mobile phone. And that is true enough. But the promise here is really increasing productivity, lowering transaction costs, increasing transparency, reducing information asymmetries in ways that really are value adding. And that's the real promise. Um, and actually, that promise is, you know, it's halfway here. As I said, I think we're appropriately hyped right now. Um, we've got a long way to go. But I think, you know, people in this room, it's a little bit of preaching to the converted here. But it's, and it does, I, still, I think at this, at this point, still require a kind of ecosystem of supporters of that, from government, from foundations, from civil society, and most importantly, from commercial players. I'm like wondering whether you believe that that... that <laughs> That, that, that sectors are working well enough with each other and countries with, with uh, you know, East Africa you've just been talking about, whether you really believe that, that you know, one, once you've sort of organized yourself in sort of M world, whether enough is being done to, to provide information to other countries, to, you know, across sectors, and mm. perhaps we'll talk about that after we've been to Turkey. Yes, well, let me first start by, um by introducing why we think, you know, this mobile for good is so important for us. Uh, we're living in a century of rapid transformation and it is full of economic, social and political changes and that seems like it's going to continue. We as corporations need to also rethink our roles and responsibilities in this era of transformation. We can, we can redefine uh, the value creation that goes beyond the business-centric approach and that strongly associates business success with social progress. And we need to put social contribution in the core of our business strategy. That's the only way it can become, it, it can become meaningful to our brand and hence our brand starts operating as a positive force of change. It becomes a trust mark instead of just a mere trademark. And this was the, very much the thinking when we started out uh, what we can do in Vodafone. And we said, we, looking at the global challenges in the world, sorry, 
starting with the imbalanced population. By 2050, the world population is expected to reach 9.2 billion people, and this growth is going to come from mostly from places that are least able to accommodate this growth. Coupled with that, the scarcity of natural resources, there will be pressing demand for water. Water consumption is expected to increase by 53% and energy by 20-26%. Coupled with that, we still are going to be talking about the poverty issue. Today, in a world where we have one out of every five people living below the poverty line, by 2050, feeding these people will be a major challenge. And business as usual is not going to do it. Hence, agriculture will, is already an important sector, but it will become even more important sector looking forward. The demand for agriculture products by year 2050 is expected to increase by 70%. Today, the agriculture industry is employing about 1 billion people. Half of these people are small-scale farmers, mostly living in rural areas. So, increasing the productivity in the agriculture is not going to be only good for meeting the food demand, but also is going to be critical for tackling the poverty issue. These were the thoughts when we looked at the agriculture, and we think that mobile, arguably, is the most ubiquitous modern technology that can help address all of these issues in, in total. Mobile today is, uh, is used by 6 billion subscribers around the world. 77% of these people are living in the developing markets. And the usage of mobile is transformational for humanity. Giving access to people on basic information, on education, on health information, or allowing cash payments among the people, it can be transformational. It can also be transformational to the societies, as it in includes the citizens' involvement to democratic processes, as we have started to see. In the case of agriculture, the transformational effect of mobile is phenomenal. In a research conducted in 26 markets that includes Turkey indicates that usage of mobile in the field of agriculture can boost the sector by 140 billion US dollars by year 2050. Half of this growth is going to come from mobile information services that Bruce talked about. A third of it will come from, from creating a, a a, an ecosystem, a virtual trading environment. So it's really, really very positive. Now, when we look at Turkey, Tur the agriculture in Turkey is, is still a very uh, fast-growing uh, opportunity for us. Turkey ranks number seven worldwide in terms of agricultural production and number one in EU. And it employs a quarter of the total nation's population. And more than half of these people are women. Yet, the GDP per capita is a big issue. Agriculture sector accounts to only 8% of the country's GDP. Now, doing agriculture in Turkey is, is tough. It's a tough job. First of all, it's very fragmented. The average livestock per a farmer, what we call farmer, is less than three usually two, two, between two to three cows per a farmer. So it's very, there is no scale in our agriculture. Secondly, the income is very poor. The rural in GDP per capita is one-fifth of the urban GDP per capita. And uh, the, the working conditions are very harsh, especially for women. So it's not, it's not a surprise that people are migrating to the cities and quitting the agriculture job, which is a concern for the government. If you look at the last 40 years, urbanization rate has increased from 38% up to 75%. So this has to be stopped. And, and it, is a, it is creating a social issue in the cities because the 
especially for the women, because they're having difficulty finding a job because of the, due to lack of education. And also for the families to adapt to a city life is not an easy one. So for the government, this is a very high agenda item to both increase the productivity in agriculture and to tackle this as a social policy. And this is where we came in and as Vodafone, in conjunction with Ministry of um, Food and Agriculture in Turkey back in 2009, we created this farmers club concept. Now, our mission is to create a sustainable agriculture through the usage of mobile technologies. So it is a, a tailor-made benefits program, putting the farmer in the center of the whole program and looking at the life of the farmer and to make improvements both in terms of economic value as well as educational value to both upgrade the agriculture and also make the, that job a sustainable job for the farmer. Starting with offering affordable communication services where there is a community effect and in fact every club member can talk free of charge inside this community. We also offer them relevant handsets such as solar power sensors or waterproof handsets. And we also offer mobile information services to educate them. Then, coupled with non-GSM benefits, such as providing a health insurance, which is a first time for this farmer. And then we also started doing some B2B with some big manufacturers, such as Unilever, to automate the whole supply chain process. Now, GSMA estimates that mobile information services can boost the crop yield up to 30%. So we, we started going ahead and sending those tailor-made SMSs with 500,000 different content that are specific in terms of location-based weather information, or it can be specific to the crop that the farmer is occupied with. It is specific in terms of the livestock that he's dealing with. We're sending them disease alerts, and together with ministry, we're sending them incentives information or useful agricultural industry information. Also in the program, there are training roadshows. So we've got literally a truck that's touring the uh, country, 170,000 kilometers covered so far, and 160 villages trained. More than 160,000 farmers got one-on-one -on -one training. And in conjunction with ministry, we're tailoring each training program. So each village gets a different training according to their occupation interest area. There is also a virtual marketplace that's established. And with a simple SMS, a farmer can post his announcement, her announcement, on this huge website and start trading. There is a very lovely story that one of our club members is dealing with potatoes and he's sent an SMS and he's gotten a 400 tons order from UK. And so he applied to us now seeking for help on how to write the response letter back in English. <laughs> That's really, it's really uh, very, so we're really proud of these stories. We're proud of our 700,000 club members who have so far in the last three years generated about roughly about 100 million euros of productivity. But I'd like to share with you a proud story uh, with a little video instead of me telling you some anecdotes, let's listen from our farmers. The video, please. In 2011 year, the winter of the winter, the cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, cold, bana gönderdiği mesajlara göre ki mesajda ya 3 günde hava soğuk, karlı eksi 20 derece ya benim hayvanlarım buna dayanamaz. Yazın sıcaklıklara göre koyunlarımın doğumunda hava sıcak diye kölgeyi aldım. O yani benim için 15-16 milyar yani çok büyük bir para. Şimdi bunu zarar etmediğim için işi garanti aldığım için Koyunumu biraz 
fazlalaştırdım. Geçen geçen yıl 120 130 bu sene 250'ye falan aşırdım. 90 günü buradayım. E, üç köpeğim, bir eşeğim, bir de cep telefonum var. Bir de Vodafone çiftçi kulübünden faydalandığım servis var. Başka hiçbir şeyim yok benim burada. Vodafone çiftçi kulübü 2434'te üye oldum. Çok faydasını gördüm. Dondu haberi geliyor veya sıcak haberi geliyor. Tedbirimizi alıyoruz. Bir de sosyal yaşamımızda faydaları oluyor. Çocuklar okula gönderirken nasıl giyinme gerektiğini veya başka köyde yapılan işler olduğu zaman onlara hava durumuna göre yapıyoruz. Tarlada ürünümüz vardı Kurban Bayramı'ndan önce. Yağmur yağacağı söyle geldi mesajı. Yaklaşık 60 bin TL civarında bir ürünümüz vardı. Ve zayiat vermeden kaldırdık ürünümüzü. Kendi ürünüm için mesaj çektim. İlk yoncamı sattım. Tekrar talepler gelmeye başladı. Bunu fark ettim. Yani artık ben bir tüccardım. Vodafone Çiftçi Kulübü'ne ilan vermem. Vodafone Çiftçi Kulübü'nün e, bir ciddiyeti olması piyasada yaptırım gücü oldu. 3 bin lira gelirim varken, normal kendi halinde bir insanken şu anda kurumsal muhataplığım var. En enteresanı Beni iki yıl öncesine tanımazdı, iki yıl öncesine kadar. İşte Mesut Bey, para hareketinizi bizden yap. Ben yani bir SMS ile yola çıkıp şu anda bu Kabayen piyasasında söz sahibi olan yani çiftçi oldum. So Vodafone Farmers Club is an example that shows us that first mobile is for good, second corporations can actually succeed in a new way, a new social business model where there's a win for all. A win for the farmer, a win for Vodafone because of more customers, a win for the agriculture sector, a win for the economy, and a win for the planet. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Duncan. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I'd I had a quote already this morning from the chap from London Business School. I was the one who said you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find things that are good. So what I'm hoping to do in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes is show you a couple of frogs um, that we hope will, will turn into princes and you'll have to see whether you, you agree with, with us or not. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to just give a bit of context for GSK and why we're interested in mobile technology, M Health technology as it's called, um, and how that kind of fits in, in for us. I think the, um, the, the, the business model for the pharmaceutical industry is actually quite simple. So we discover and develop new medicines, and we try to get those medicines to as many people and as many patients as possible who need them. And it's this second half of access to those medicines that we've been spending a lot more time on and want to do a lot more on um, in the future. And this is an area where we feel like, as an industry and as a company, we should be more ambitious. So it's this access point that where it really, the mobile technology really fits in for us. And I wanted to give you an example from my unit. So I lead a unit which is called Developing Countries and Market Access. If I click onto the slide, give you just a few kind of bullet points. What is this unit? So we look after the 50 least developed countries in the world using the UN definition of least developed. And that's about 40 countries in Africa and 10 in Asia. The unique thing about the unit is it's a hybrid. So it's 50% focused on what I might call a classic business growth model but it's also 50% focused on corporate responsibility. And we think that's very important because we're operating in areas of obviously very low income with very high patient need. And what we wanted to do is increase the company's focus and frankly flexibility to do some different things in these very resource challenged countries. Where those kind of things come together business growth responsibilities around volume, and that's very much the, 
the kind of DNA of the unit is where can we seek more volume opportunities such that that can reach our corporate responsibility target, but also be good for business. You know, we believe in the long-term economic potential of least developed countries. They won't all be least developed forever. And actually now is a pretty good time to invest and to build our footprint such that we can benefit from economic success of those countries in the future and at the same time reach more patients and, and meet our corporate responsibility goals. The strategy of the unit is very simple. We look at four key areas. The first one is immunization, so implementation of vaccines in least developed countries. And you'll hear a little bit more about that this afternoon of an announcement uh, with ourselves and Vodafone and other partners also involved in this. So I won't um, go into that too much now. Um, the second area is reach, making more of our medicines available um, to more pharmacies, uh, more people in the distribution chain, and most importantly, portfolio expansion. So moving our portfolio from treating infectious disease which is where most of the medicines are available in least developed countries, starting to treat chronic disease as patients live longer and have more economic wealth. They can start to treat uh, chronic disease like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, etc., etc. The third area is our people, so supporting their development of the 750 people in the unit so they can be the eyes and ears for the company on the ground. The fourth area is healthcare infrastructure, and this is really where um, the, the, the, the partnerships angle and the connectivity angle comes much more into play. Uh, healthcare infrastructure is a huge need in least developed countries, as you, I'm sure you're not surprised about that. Um, one statistic that I often quote in, in this area is if you take Africa as a continent, Africa has to cope with 24% of the world's disease burden with only 3% of the world's healthcare workers and only 1% of the world's healthcare budget. So the need for healthcare capacity and infrastructure in developing countries is incredibly acute. But clearly it's not something that one company or one organization can tackle on its own. The economics you know, just don't make sense. So what we look at is how can we create uh, more partnerships that can actually start to tackle these areas. Partnerships that can share technology, partnerships that can share risk and investment. Um, and there, together, we can make more of a difference to these challenges. So we look at three areas to support healthcare infrastructure. First is healthcare worker training. And we invest 20% of, the, of any profit we make in each least developed country back into healthcare worker training in that country, which is um, roughly $6 million a year. 10,000 healthcare workers is our target for training. We look at the impact the private sector can have and where we can take the benefits of the private sector and link that with the public sector and what governments are already doing. And we look at partnerships in terms of access to finance, which is very important in the supply chain, and then in, in mHealth. And here we, we come finally to the, to the frogs. Um, so the first one I'm gonna um, show you is, is one um, which looks at counterfeit medicines. Now in developing countries, up to 30% of all medicines that are taken by patients are counterfeit. There's no you know, exact number, but that's thought to be roughly the, the number we're talking about. And, and the reason for that is that the, the level of regulation um, is very weak, um, and therefore the controls around medicine supply are weak, and therefore that opens the door to um, a lot of fake medicines. One of the things that we wanted to do is say, well, how could we use the technology that's around to make a bigger difference um, in this area? So we looked at our, what, what, what we could apply to our medicines, and um, we picked the medicine, which I've got in my pocket here, um, which is called Ampiclox, which we sell in Nigeria. Now, Ampiclox is a, an antibiotic. It's a very good medicine for skin infections. And it was one of the most heavily counterfeited medicines in the Nigerian market, and also one of our highest volume products. So we thought, well, we'll get this 
going with amper clocks, then we can you know, see how that technology can work for, for other medicines. So on this next slide, which is, you've got a picture up there of, of what I'm holding in my hand, um, you, can see the, um, you can see a kind of a scratch off panel um, on the blister pack of, of 10 Ampiclox tablets. And what the patient does is when they receive the medicine, they can scratch off that panel and it will, it will reveal a, a unique pin number and then they text that pin number um, onto, a, onto a code, onto the, uh, the code that's on the, uh, on the, um, on the pack, okay? And when that, when that comes back, you can see on the mobile phone that because the PIN number is registered through a database, there's confirmation that the medicine is okay. And if it's not accurate, or if there's a problem, the message comes back that you've got a fake medicine. So how does, how's that working in practice? So I've got a, I brought some of the, quickly, some of the data on my cheat sheet here, so I can't remember all these numbers. Um, so, so this, since we launched it last year, um, 890,000 patients have used this service, very high. And roughly 11% of all medicines, of, of this medicine, patients use that service, which is much, much higher than I would have thought launching this. I was thinking it would be 2 to 3%. And I think the reason is it's high is because you're giving the patient some control. And the patient never really has control about what medicines, whether the medicine's quality or not. Or not. So I think that's, that's a, a big factor here. And then you might be interested in the messages. So 85% of those messages that were received were genuine. 13% were keying in errors, mistakes over the PIN number. 2% were actually attributable to, to counterfeit products. And that 2% has resulted in 19 investigations in Nigeria to try and track down um, and bring to account the, um, the counterfeit medicine situation. So we, we, think this is, we think this has legs, we think it's sustainable, and we're now launching it in 70% of our portfolio of medicines in Nigeria. The Nigerian regulator um, is also very enthusiastic about that, and, and, and now all uh, new antibiotics and antimalarials in Nigeria will have to have um, this technology. And we're also launching it in Kenya, we launched it last month, and just last week, uh, we launched it in Tanzania as well. So I think a good example of technology, which I think relatively cheap, and I should say that this resulted in a volume uplift from 32,000 blister packs a month to 36,000 blister packs a month. So there's a business benefit which helps pay for the two or three cents per blister pack technology that, that is involved. So my next one is um, uh, an operation called One Family Health. So this is a, a, a contribution to healthcare infrastructure. It's a, a nurse-operated clinic franchise model that operates in East Africa, currently in Kenya with about 80 clinics. Um, and we're now um, supporting the expansion of this model into Rwanda. It combines the incentives of the private sector integrated with the government system such that the nurse operates the franchise and by um, taking out a microfinance loan can run the clinic herself and has um, empowered to um, uh, deal with medicines which roughly can impact 70% of the, of the conditions and diseases prevalent in the country and run it as a franchise. So once the nurse reaches 20, 25 patients a day, they can start to break even, start to make a profit. So there's a big incentive in the system. And what I want to do is show a video um, which actually gives you a bit more color to what's happening on the ground in Rwanda and gives a bit more detail in terms of the technology that's being applied um, on the mobile front, which is actually bringing us very powerful information um, about how the system is working. So if you can run the video. Dawn in Rwanda. It is 6 a.m. on what promises to be a bright, clear June morning. Esperance Mura Kateti, 
the nurse franchisee at the Child and Family Wellness Health Post in Rotunga, is preparing breakfast and getting ready to walk the half mile up the hill to the post to open it for the day's first influx of patients. Its building is the result of an initiative between One Family Health and the Rwandan government. It's a new concept. Bring the care near the population, uh, give high importance to community care, prevention and treatment, knowing that we want to keep 80% of health problems at community level, and the PPP, that is something that is really encouraged to promote the private sector, but also to compensate what the public sector cannot do fast. This innovative partnership aims to increase access to basic sustainable health care and high quality medicines for around 2 million people each year in rural communities in Rwanda. But what is unique about the health posts in Rwanda is both the way they've been set up and the support technology employed to maintain consistent quality standards. Any patient coming into the health post will first need to speak to the receptionist who will check their documentation to see if they are covered by the Mutual, Rwanda's contributory medical insurance fund. For the poorest in the community, this is free, but most patients will need to pay 200 Rwandan francs, about 40 US cents, at each visit, as an administrative co-payment collected on behalf of the fund. The health posts are being set up to provide entry-level health care and so are close to the bottom of the health care pyramid. This is based initially on contact with community health workers and then on informal upward referral to health posts. Then, where necessary, more formal referral to local comprehensive clinics and on up to district hospitals and finally teaching hospitals. We have uh, task shifting, giving nursing task to community health workers, uh, doctor's task to nurses, specialist task to uh, general practitioners, etc., just to provide more care and assuring quality. So we improve geographic access, we improve the quantity and the quality of care, and we break uh, financial barrier through a health insurance called Mutuel. In order to understand why the introduction of the health posts has made such an impact, we need to look at the background supporting structure and the innovative technology used in them. The management of the, of the health post is uh, via a phone device. So the nurses are using only a simple phone to use to do their own management of the health facility. As the receptionists perform the initial patient examination, they enter this data into an internet-enabled mobile phone system and send it on to the nurse so that she has any preliminary or pre-existing data to hand when she sees the patient. As the consultation with the patient progresses, the nurse adds to the initial data as she makes her diagnosis and prescribes appropriate therapy, entering any relevant details on the handset. The system is designed to allow data to be utilised in different ways. The mobile phones connect to a dedicated server at the MTN Data Management Centre where the traffic can be processed to provide real-time granular disease management and administrative records. The data is routed through to computers in the franchisor's office and to the laptops of OFH staff based in Kigali. Specific individual codes allow other OFH personnel in the UK and USA to access the feed and closely monitor operations in Rwanda. Because the system is open sourced, it is also linked into the electronic record system at the Rwandan Ministry of Health. This communication system works in real time and is amazingly cost effective being some 30 times less expensive than using SMS technology. Prescribing at the posts is closely monitored, meaning OFH can achieve efficient stock control and avoidance of over-prescribing. Happy to see that helps, uh, to, to see that helps post there because uh, our children, all our students, uh, uh, took 
more than eight kilometers to her to arrive at Centre de Santé. Uh, but now, if a student fall sick, we, we, uh, we take him and go there and uh, they take care of him. This program of expansion can only be achieved through the commitment of the Ministry of Health, who provide the physical structures for the posts, the shell of the building, if you like, and the continued generosity of existing donors such as GSK, who are providing One Family Health with loan financing to build the network to the target 500 posts, and Ecobank, who are supplying loan finance as well as business and financial training for the franchisees. Okay, so just to finish up, um, I think it's an example of a project that we was already happening, but we wanted to support for bring it to more to scale. I also think it's an example of a project where technology isn't the only thing that supports this project. There are many more parameters that we think will allow it to get to scale and be sustainable, but technology becomes a very important aspect to enable better management, better connectivity. And I think what's interesting is, in a developing country setting, we're able to use technology to actually start to, to put um, Rwandan patients on electronic patient record databases. Whereas in a lot of developed countries, you know, we're not yet at that point. So it's also a very good example of where, you know, good technology now can help sort of leapfrog um, into a better place in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to take a very short break here at this point, about 15 minutes. And um, what we've uh, seen in this first morning session are the advantages of best practice uh, from one country to another and from one sector to another. And we've talked about the future and the scale of challenges ahead, not least um, how does business scale mobile for good to make it sustainable. We've got a lot more to come. And we're going to talk about more um, innovative case studies and solutions are going forward. And then we can talk about scalability and sustainability in the afternoon session. 15 minutes, if you can come back at 11.45 or just afterwards, we'll kick off again at 11.50. Thank you. Good. And you, thank you. <laughs>